my channel. It's Eponine, aka Epi, and happy Valentine's Day. I hope your guys' day is going a lot better than the people we have talked about this week. Today's video is going to be the most lighthearted case that we're going to talk about this week. And I know when you look at the title of this video, lighthearted is not going to be the first thing that comes to mind. So let me kind of explain where I'm coming from. This was a crime that took place. However, everybody involved was a bad guy. So to me, it wasn't quite as like heartbreaking and emotionally devastating as some of the other cases we've talked this week. So I do want to go ahead and give my normal disclaimer before we get into it that when I do these videos, I mean no disrespect or offense to anybody involved, none of the victims or any of their families. This is all just information that I have compiled off the internet and put into one location so that people who are interested in this case can come to one spot to find a lot of info. So with that being said and without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So back in the 1920s and the 1930s, gangs were really big in the United States, but not the kind of gangs you hear about today. It wasn't like Bloods and Crips type of gangs. It was like mafia mobster type of gangs. And two of the big people who kind of ran the scenes were Al Capone and Bugs Moran. Now Al Capone, I'm sure you've heard of. Bugs Moran, you maybe have not heard of quite as much. So Bugs Moran ran the Northside Gang and they were Irish and Al Capone ran the Southside Gang, and they were Italian. So these two gangs were of different country origins, and that was one of the reasons they didn't get along, as well as the fact that this was during the time that Prohibition was really, really big. So these two gangs were kind of competing with each other as far as bootlegging, which was like smuggling in illegal alcohol and things like that. Now, issues with the two gangs started out as kind of a tit for tat, little issues, and then eventually over time escalated into bigger issues and eventually it turned into the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So originally when this plan was set up by Al Capone, the plan was to kill Bugs Moran and a few of his lieutenants. So to take out the top gang leader and a couple of his top men. So the Northside gang was brought to a location under the premise that they would get a stolen cut rate ship of whiskey. And it was gonna be supplied by the Purple Gang of Detroit who was associated with Al Capone. Now on Valentine's Day, most of Moran's men had already entered the garage getting ready to go pick up the liquor by around 10.30 or so. However, Moran had slept in that day, so he actually was not there yet. And it was at this time that somebody named Albert Weinshank, who looked a lot like Bugs Moran, he was the same build, he was wearing the same clothes as him that day, he had a lot of the same physical characteristics. He walked into the garage, and at this point, all of Al Capone's men thought that Bugs Moran was at the garage. So at this point, it is believed that Al Capone ordered his men to attack. And Al Capone sent in four men, two of whom were dressed in police uniforms, and the other two were dressed in just normal clothing for that time. So pants, shirts, ties, jackets, hats, they were very well dressed. Now the four of them walked into this garage and ordered Moran's seven men up against a wall. The two police officers then signaled for the two men who had walked in in their plain suits to open fire and shoot the men. So at this point, the two men who were dressed in the plain street clothes pulled out two Tommy submachine guns, one of which held 20 rounds, the other of which held 50 rounds, and they just opened fire. They started sweeping left to right on the crowd of people who had their backs to them, and they continued to shoot even after the men had fallen and were already on the ground. So this was a very bloody, very brutal massacre of seven men. Now, to give the appearance that everything was under control, the men in street clothes were actually ordered out of the garage by the men in the police uniforms so that it could look like they were getting in trouble for the shooting when really they were in on it together. Now, back inside of the garage, the only survivors were Highball, who was a dog, and Frank Gessenberg, who had been shot 14 times. However, he did not die immediately. And the police kept asking him, since you're alive, tell us who did this. Tell us who shot you guys. Tell us who was behind this. And even though he was riddled with 14 bullet wounds, the only thing that Frank Gusenberg had to say was that nobody shot him. So even though he knew he was probably about to die, he was still not going to snitch. Now, Frank Gusenberg did end up dying three hours later at the hospital as a result of his gunshot wounds. And he was one of the seven victims. The other men killed were Peter Gusenberg, who was Frank Gusenberg's brother, 
and they were both hired killers who worked for the gangs. Albert Kachelik, who went by James Clark, and he was Moran's second in command. Adam Heyer, the bookkeeper and business manager of the Moran gang. Reinhardt Schwimmer, who was an optician who actually abandoned his practice to go gamble on horse races and just hang out with the gang members. He just liked to be a part of that scene. The sixth person who died was Albert Weinshank, who managed several dry cleaning and dyeing operations for Moran, and he was the one who resembled Moran and set this whole massacre into motion when he entered the garage. And John May, who really wasn't even part of the gang. He was just a mechanic who worked on the cars, but unfortunately he was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Now, it was common knowledge that Moran was hijacking Al Capone's Detroit-based liquor shipments where he was working with the Purple Gang. So the cops started to look at the Purple Gang first and to see if maybe they were behind this. Mugshots of Purple Gang members were passed out by their landladies as possible shooters. However, they were later cleared of being involved in the shooting, but their gang is always going to be tied to the shooting and just always kind of be associated and known with it because of their ties with Al Capone and his gang. Now, after a lot of investigation, there was two of Al Capone's gunmen named John Scalise and Albert Anselmi, as well as two men named Jack McGurn and Frank Rio were all charged with the massacre. John Scalisi, along with Anselmi and somebody named Joseph Yanta, were murdered by Capone in May of 1929 after Al Capone learned that they had a plan to kill him. And for Jack McGurn, he actually had the charges dropped due to lack of evidence. So there was people who were assumed guilty of this crime from Al Capone's gang, but none of them actually faced any charges for it. Now, the case stayed kind of stagnant until December 14th of 1929 when the Berrien County, Michigan Sheriff's Department raided the St. Joseph, Michigan bungalow of a man named Frederick Dane, who was the registered owner of a car that was driven by somebody named Fred Killer Burke. Now, Burke had been drinking that night, and he had rear-ended another car and drove off from the scene. A patrolman named Skelly pursued Burke and actually forced him off the road, and he was shot three times as he approached Burke, so Burke killed this police officer. The car was found wrecked and abandoned just outside of St. Joseph's and was traced to a man named Fred Dane but police were actually able to identify him as Fred Burke, who was a man who was actually wanted in participation for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Now, when the police raided Burke's bungalow, they found a trunk containing a bulletproof vest, they found $320,000 in bonds that were recently stolen from a bank, they found two Tommy guns, like the one that was used in the massacre, they found pistols, they found shotguns, and they found thousands of rounds of ammunition. Now, St. Joseph authorities called the Chicago police, who requested that both of the machine guns be brought in at once, and even though forensic ballistics was still pretty new at this time, they were actually able to match the machine guns with the ones used in the massacre. They were also able to tie one of the machine guns to another murder of a man named Frank Yale. Now, Burke was captured over a year later on a Missouri farm, and he was actually tried and sentenced to life in prison for just all of his various charges that he had against him, and he died in prison in the year 1940. Now, there honestly were no other arrests or any other concrete evidence for this massacre. Even though it's widely believed that Al Capone and his men were behind it, they actually never faced real charges for it. Al Capone never went to jail for this. Now, for those of you who don't know Al Capone's story, he ended up getting arrested later on in his life. He ended up in Alcatraz and actually ended up dying from heart complications because of syphilis. So Al Capone did have a pretty sad life towards the end of his life, but he did not face charges for this massacre. And there have been many people who said that they were involved in this massacre, and there's many theories about who was involved in this massacre, but it's still unclear what exactly caused the actions on that day because it's unclear who exactly caused the actions on that day. And if anybody is interested in learning more about this, there is a ton of information online about it, about the different theories, about the different people who may have been involved. There actually is a mob museum that has pieces of the wall that they were shot in front of, so the Valentine's Day Massacre wall, and you can actually see all of the bullet holes in it, and it's pretty crazy. But this is one case that if you are interested in, I really, really urge you to do your own research because there's so much information and so much more than I could ever fit into a short video for you guys. So yeah, that is it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time. I really, really appreciate it. I hope you are all having a fantastic Valentine's Day. And until next time, I love you all very much, and we will touch base soon. Bye. Thank you.